Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 270 for Wednesday, September 9th, 2020. folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians, or at least musicians who are trying to be working musicians. <laughs> uh, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Napomo, I really like that word, man. It's like, I, it's a good word. So, has Napomo treating you well? Are you, uh, are, how are you, like, in the thick of the smog and fires and, like, the result of the fires and all that? Or are you... We're kind of, we're kind of in between the two areas where there are a lot of fires, but our good. skies are ridiculous today. They got kind of a brown haze thick, you know, it's almost like a fog. Yeah. The color's not right, right? So you can't yeah. see very far. I know the pictures that my friends up in Northern California posting are ridiculous. It ridiculous. looks like Mars up there. It's orange. It's yeah, it's crazy. Orange. Yeah. My daughter in San Francisco, middle of the day, you know, about a half hour ago, she posted something. It is the most unnatural color that you could imagine. So... <laughs> My heart goes out to everybody who has dealt with this in one way or another. You know, uh, the big fires that were in the Santa Cruz area that evacuated so many people and just destroyed so much, you know, forestation. Yeah. Uh, Nick from my band took in, I think, seven people because he's from that area. Wow. Um, he, he lived in that area for a while. His yep. kids are from that. And he's had seven people who were just evacuated and nowhere to go. So he opened his home because he's that type of guy. And uh, yeah, I mean, this state is crazy and it's, he's, there has to be an observation that it's getting worse. Seems to actually, be. I don't know. You know, it, it's one of those. I mean, yeah, I, and I don't want to minimize this at all because what's going on currently, especially with all of our friends that are in Northern and Southern California is, I mean, it's awful to have to live through this. Even in Oregon, like where my son was, which is far less bad than what they're experiencing there. It's, you know, he texted us and actually even FaceTimed us the other day. He's like, I've never seen anything like this. Like, yeah, well, yeah. welcome to the West Coast, kiddo. Um, but, but, you know, there, there is something to be said about the ubiquity of news, right? Like, you know, it, it, the, the internet has created the opportunity for news to not just be on a 24 hour cycle, but everyone's news is now everyone's news. You're not just hearing about what's happening locally to you or might affect you. Everything is everywhere. And social media kind of adds to that. Um, yeah, but the data for this is there. So okay. I, I don't disagree right. with your premise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, the, right. The governor came on and said there were X amount of thousands of acres burned in mm. all of 2019. There's X amount of millions of acres burned in 2020 so far. And there's Got still it. technically three months to the fire season still, right. you know, to go. So, I mean, there's, there's, okay, some, yeah. I so I, 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 premise. I, I, like, I separate the, I don't retract the premise. I separate the premise from what's actually going on here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I, know, you know, I know how to get to you. I just have to appeal to the data side of your Yeah, brain. no, it's, it's, it makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, speaking of like data and cleaning things up, Isotope, which is, you know, I am, by and large, I am a huge fan of all of the built-in plugins in Logic. I, mm -hmm. I can get like almost everything done that I want to do with their, their plugins. But as listeners of this show know... There are a few that few third party plugins that really make a difference for me. And thus far, most of them are made by a company called Isotope. And I recently got a chance to check out the the new version of their RX plugin. So it's Isotope RX8 is its name. And this is built to clean up sound. Paul, this plugin is like magic. I mean, the best thing to do what is. What does the definition of clean up sound mean? Well, that's what I mean. It like it's a broad definition, and this thing will do like anything that I've thrown at it. Now, the best thing to do is to record music, you know, or your tracks with without noise and without any mess. But as we all know, sometimes that's you know after it's after it's recorded that you realize, oh wait, like there's a problem here. You can, like, if you're, they've got a, a, a guitar denoise thing, which is actually not just a thing, it's several things that can, like, pull out fret squeaks and wow. pick sounds and amp buzz. Wow. I, dude, it, but it's so easy to use. If you've got headphone bleed, you know, from, like, you're recording a vocal, but you're, you know, the music was too loud in the headphones and it's bleeding through, no problem. You know, it'll, it'll fix that. 
it like it's crazy all the different cleanup stuff that it'll do uh to you know you can you can take audio that was recorded like over the phone and clean it up and make it sound full it's oh it, when i say magic i mean magic like I, so this is one plugin or this is a suite of plugins yes it yes is the answer um it is one plugin that sort of it has all of these various things in it and you apply what you need to to you know to your existing track or or scenario whatever it might be but man yeah. it's crazy right? yeah oh dude like I've been wanting to check this out for a while and, and they kept saying to me, well, you know, just wait until the new version comes out and you'll, you know, that's, that's the one you want to check out. Holy cow. Like now I can't wait to have, like, we've got, actually got some other tracks going on with our, our Mac old all-star band thing, but everybody's tracks are clean. So I don't know that I'll need this, <laughs> but, but, um, I, you know, I threw some stuff at it. It's amazing. So I was really What's stuck. Cost? Uh, you know, it like, there's all kinds of different pricing options. You can get, uh, there's the th there's three versions of it elements which is sort of the the basic standard and then advanced and elements is 99 standard is 299 and advanced is 999 so mm. it depends but you can definitely get started for 100 bucks you know so yeah there you go yeah we'll put a link in the show notes Smart i found guys I, they are they what i like about isotope is i mean a they make plugins that actually do a thing that's that's remarkably better or simply different from what you can get built in with your daw and right. their plugins all know about each other so when you're using like you know they've got um th their channel strip plugin which is like th their neutron thing um that links in with everything else that it does so it knows like if you've got neutron on multiple tracks they can kind of it can kind of interact with each other in smart ways so you can you can kind of you know keep things tidy it can like, all their plugins can see each other so, which is really cool um and their yeah. ozone thing for mastering can see into your neutron plugin so that it can see your channel strip and how that all works it's it's fantastic so yeah they they've got some great stuff i'm 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 a big fan of everything isotope does cool yeah put the, put it in the show notes i will yeah. zoom check it out. uh zoom this week or recently added a um a feature called high fidelity audio now, this doesn't mean that we can like zoom with each other, Paul, and, uh, you know, play music together because there's still the latency problem. But let me pause you right there. Is the latency problem physics or is the latency problem just the engineering hasn't caught up to it yet? I mean, I've, I've read both that, you know, there will eventually be technology that can eliminate or, or reduce latency. But I've, I've heard many engineers saying there's a certain amount of physics to getting a packet from point A to point B. That's going to exist. That exists. That's right. Yeah. No, I mean, could that be reduced if we changed the way the Internet worked? Yes. But but given that we're going to lay this on top of the Internet, you know, you and me, coast to coast, we're probably at best going to see maybe. 40 millisecond turnaround, maybe 30, but, but not certainly nothing faster than that. Even with my neighbors here, you know, it, the same town, we're at 20 to 30 milliseconds. So there's always that. And then there's whatever software processing you're doing. Like when we talk to, I can't remember Dan's last name, Dan, well, I can't remember his name from Ray. No, from pop, uh, from pop fiction. What's his last name? Meb Meblin. Meblin. Thank you. I had the B and the L. I couldn't get the rest of it. Uh, <laughs> when uh, when, uh, when we talked to Dan about that, he talked about a product that he had worked on called Jamlink, which was a hardware solution and really kind of kept things down, uh, it, it, you know, the latency down because it was all they were they were doing it all in hardware. So there wasn't a, a lot of software, you know, overhead of an operating system and things like that. So. Uh, you know, they, he said with that, you were able to actually functionally rehearse. I've used Jamulus here with, uh, with Russ in fling and that worked. Um, it's, it's a little weird. It kind of reminded me of being on a big stage, uh, you know, and I've got to now rewind, like, I don't know, 30 years or something that that first time on a big stage where monitor, you know, we weren't using in-ears back then or anything. So, you know, yes, you have a monitor, but maybe you don't have any guitar in your monitor, right? As, as the drummer and the guitar player is, you know, 20 feet away or something, which should, you should never let happen like 
by surprise to you as a band. Yeah. It, you don't use the whole stage if you don't need to, you know, get, but, but we did cause we were kids and we're like, Oh dude, we can spread out, you know? Yeah. yeah. It reminded me of that because we were playing to each other and slowing each other down a little bit. And it was like, Oh, right. I, I just need to keep time and Russ will stay with me. Even though Russ is hearing me like he's 20 feet away, you know, cause it's about a millisecond a foot is what it turns out to, to be the delay. Right. Um, and so that's what it reminded me of. And it took us a little bit, but we got through a song together and it was like, okay, Hey, like we, you know, we did it. Um, then we all got tested and hung out on Russ's deck and actually played a song together and that was way better. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can it like the tech is close. There is, there is a, the, I, so to answer your question, to circle back, the answer is yes to both. There is a physics limitation, right? And when we say physics, we say th because of the way the internet is, is currently designed and in use. Beyond that, um, you can get the tech to, to play nice, but you've got to have everything just right. You know, and, and when I say everything like Russ is on a Windows machine, so he had to make sure he was using ASIO drivers, not the other kind of Windows drivers, because they are much lower latency and you can get, you know, uh, more closer to real time, you know, monitoring that sort of thing. So if you've got software that's adding in tens of milliseconds to this, well, that's a problem. You want to sort of eliminate that. On Max Core Audio is pretty good, so it just takes care of it for you. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. But Zoom, this high fidelity audio that Zoom added, what it's great for is like, let's say you and I are working on tracks together. Um, I could, I could set up a zoom session here, share my screen with you. You could see logic. I could pump my logic sound out to you and you could just hear it without it. You know, we turn on high fidelity audio and now you're getting the actual sound from logic. We don't have to use like, you know, we talked earlier, I don't know, four or five months ago about a plugin that you could use and listen like high quality in your web browser while you were using zoom for not audio, but just video, you know, that whole thing. And, uh, and so you don't have to deal with that anymore. They've just built it into zoom. You just turn it on and, uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. There's an article that describes where to go and do that. But I thought that was pretty good. Like for, yeah. you know, for these kinds of things, um, it's good. Or if you're, if you're streaming a, a concert on zoom, which I've seen some people do, you'd want to do this as well, because now you you've got actual good quality sound. It's not being put through all the zoom processing, but it's also a much higher bandwidth sound. So, so you I know. wonder how in the Uber sense, in the big sense, yeah. if it looks like the world is going to start going back to normal at some point in time, is there going to be a rush for better, you know, will, will development money for virtual things, start to get diverted to helping people repick up mm. physical environments. And we would, you know, like zoom just kind of, you know, they yeah. zoomed, you know, to the lead. Right. Yep. And, but, but, you know, Microsoft and Google aren't going to let that happen. So you have, you know, Google meet and which yep. Microsoft's team teams. teams yep. Right. And then there's FaceTime and, you know, I, I think, that, you know, there are a few others that are out there still, but, um, but you wonder, you know, Companies can't be all things to all people all the time. Right now, there's an immediate need that people are trying to, you know, make make money on. I wonder if when uh, when the skies clear up, if uh, all that development money, if there's a lot more things to solve in terms of getting people back on hybrid, more hybrid solutions, maybe or you know whatever it may be to, to kind of, you know, it won't be all about virtual solutions. Right. We no, it's going to be a, a hybrid. I think I think you're right. I you know, and we like the hybrid thing has existed for a while. Some bands have been doing the, hey, sign up if you can't come to the show because you're either, you know, you've got some reason or you're thousands of miles away, pay 25 bucks and we'll live stream the show to you and that that kind of thing. I mean, Fish has been notorious for doing that for, for years now and other bands too. Like I, I see that happening at some level because um, it is, it's another, you know, revenue stream. I mean, that's like, and if you can't, make as much money like if we have to start even if it's next summer if the you know touring industry can restart but it's all you know less than a hundred percent capacity kind of thing um they're gonna need to be able to do things like this so yeah so i think yeah. i think hybrid is where it's going i had to cancel from a gig this weekend paul it sucked why because I had surgery on Wednesday. I, I Oh, yeah. Sorry, man. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it was an outdoor, perfectly socially distanced uh, bitter pill gig, which I was, I've was i been looking forward to for months. And um, 
Yeah, I had surgery Wednesday. I realized <clears throat> my gallbladder told me it needed to come out. And uh, and or really, it told the doctors it needed to come out. And, and it turns out it was correct. So um, planning gig, you know, 48 hours, maybe or 72 hours after surgery. I, you know, I was sort of on the fence about it, but everybody else is like, dude, that would be stupid. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. That would be stupid. So, um, yeah. but it, you know, it's, it's, it's September and I live in New England. So every yeah. gig could be the last one. And now it's like crap. So... So, but I have played yeah. my drums since then and, and I can play there's, there's, there's something happening on Saturday that, um, they might need a drummer for. And I told them I can play, but I can't lug anything. And so uh -huh. there's, there's some, there's, well, there's why would you want to do that? Right. You're on that 15 pound thing and no yeah. exertion, you know, why did you say I can play? Well, I can play like playing well, isn't, playing isn't an issue. Um, but you don't play easy. I mean, everything you do, you, you put a lot of body into, right? Yeah. But I, I, when I sat down the other day, what I, what I did was I paid really close attention, um, to my abdomen, right? Like, cause that's where there's the sort of the big incision and uh, that I have to worry about. And I'm on a 15 pound weight limit or whatever it is, um, which totally makes sense. I have no, no issues with this. And I was paying attention to like how tight like, when I'm playing, What's happening with my abdomen? And I realized years ago when I started singing from behind the drum kit, I had to get my posture together such that my abdomen was totally relaxed 100% of the time, except when I'm singing. So singing would be a probably a bad thing. In fact, I'm, it could be argued that doing what we're doing right now is probably a bad thing, too, because I use my diaphragm to, you know, to talk here. But, um, but for, in terms of actual playing, I mean... It would have to be the right scenario where I'm really not tempted to, you know, be like, oh, screw it. Let me just grab this thing and move it or whatever. Like, I have to mm. be 100 percent about that. But I, I yeah, I, I think it would be OK. Um, I, I found, you know, up until I, there were a couple of days there um, since surgery that I found that at the end of the day, my back was killing me. And I'm like, what's going on? And I realized I was keeping my abdomen tight just all the time, just as a protective measure. And I'm like, wait a minute, this seems bad. So I've had to be really sort of self-aware of, of making sure it stays loose. And so I was surprised when I sat down with the kid, it was like, Oh wait, like I don't have to be aware of it. This just happens naturally because of, mm. because of how I've trained myself over the years. So yeah. Right. So the, the power, like my, my legs and my arms are not tightening my abdomen to do anything. They're all kind of you know, separate from that. Yeah. But you're right. Like it's still a fair question to ask and it's a, you know, fair process to go through. Like, is it really worth it? So, yep. You're a digger inner. I am a digger inner, but I want to be able to dig in for a long period of time. So if that means <laughs> I got to make the right decision short term for a long term gain, I'm okay with it. Yeah. So. Hey, I have a little uh, break in the, in the skies, a little, a little sliver of blue. We got two wedding gig offers for 2021. Mm. So uh, that's kind of exciting that people are starting to look ahead and, you know, I'm sure we'll amend our contracts to have COVID clauses in it now, but you know, that there's some thing in the future that people are starting to think about is kind of good. Um, I, I, I started using um, uh, gig masters. Yeah. Which is an online booking, booking service. That's what and, Gary uh, used to build Uptown Celebration up to what it is, like the 100% of what he used to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I get a lot of oddly really short notice, like like this this weekend we, we need a band type of thing for oh, that. Wow. I haven't gotten very many looking out into the future. I've also, even though I have my band up there, I get a lot of requests for just a solo guitarist for parties. Maybe because that's what they're doing now is they're not, you know, maybe that's a a social distancing clause, but I've got an, a weird number of, we're having a birthday party. We want a guitarist, um, assuming that a band would just parse out their guitarist. Cause I don't have sure. anything on the gig master site that says that. So, so the gig no, masters gig, changed their name. Sorry, are they, sorry. are they the bash gig now? Gig salad. Sorry. That's okay. I, I, gig is gig, salad is, is, is gig masters the bash now? Is that, did I, they I think that's right. But what we use is gig salad, gig salad. I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Got it. All right. I'll put both of them in. So, there. sure. Yeah, Gig Masters was the first one. They went through a bunch of changes and yeah. it got hard to kind of figure out what they were, what their business model was. But Gig Salad, I got to say, there's been a steady stream of inquiries. Um, actually, the the wedding uh, the wedding thing that we got uh, two of them were from the House Rockers website, so that's good. That's great. But um, just the thought that you know we can put things on the calendar in the future and 
kind of have something to aim for is is uh, just a little bit of encouragement, you know. Yeah, man. Hope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I have an idea for you. Um, I was thinking a lot about music styles, genres. Okay. And as things are changing um, and, you know, everything's on the table for what live music will be like as this comes back. I wanted to tell you a story about the house rockers and its origin, how we got to be the type of band that we are. Okay. And just get your kind of like thoughts on, uh, on what live music might be. So my premise is that any kind of style of music can be entertaining if it's good. Any kind of music is almost by definition dance music, you know, but certainly popular music. It, if you do it right, it moves people, right? So, yes, the, I, I would I would say that those those are two different things because you could listen to King Crimson and probably have trouble dancing, but it can move you. Right. But it, it will move your body in some way. I yes. If you see people listening to Rush. Right. You right. See people with their eyes closed, kind of swaying to whatever it's speaking to them. Correct. The, the challenge with a lot of covers bands is you get the spirit of the song, but not the essence of the song. And you lose that sensitive groove for a lot of these things. I mean, that's in the interpretation, but sure. anyway, I'll get back to that in a second. So when I started the house rockers, I wanted to do a rock band. Uh, I liked Stax, Philly soul, a little bit of Motown. You know, I, I liked those influences, but I liked how rock and roll, um, uh, clearly drew those as influences to create what they create. That that style of music talks to me more than like metal or anything like that. So, okay, sure. I'm, you know, you know my style. I like I like Petty and I like you know um, uh, Bob Seger and Springsteen and, and I, I like that kind of like yeah roots American you know style of stuff. But you know, there's Beatles and Stones are are foundational. When I built my band and uh, I had one guy join the band, he was like, "Dude, you got a horn band. We got to play funk." I was like, "What?" He was like, no, that's the music that'll get people dancing. And if you get if you get girls dancing, then you'll get guys wanting to come out and see you. And that's how you build an audience. That was that was the premise. It's a decent premise. And it's a it, well, it's a decent premise, it's, although it's different from my worldview, which is like rock and roll gets plenty of people dancing. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be Johnny B. Good to get people dancing. You could take a million stones grooves and people will dance to it. And and I. I, I think any music can be popular. Any popular music can be dance music if it's played right. I think where a lot of stuff um, gets lost in the translation is grooves get too heavy, you know, to lose the essence of a song. We've talked about some of these songs like, like Honky Tonk Woman is an interesting one because you could almost do anything to that song and people will, will kind of. People stand it, right? up the moment they hear the cowbell. Like it, yeah. like it, like they don't know what, what else to do. They just get it. It's the same as, you know, you start up Sweet Home Alabama and, and suddenly everybody's on their feet. Like it's, it's, it's just, it's a rule of, of nature for some reason. Yes. It is a rule of nature. So th I'll, I'll ask you the question, like is, is rock any better or worse? Can you pick 20 rock songs that are every bit as good dance music as 20 Earth, Wind and Fire songs or TV Wonder songs? Is there, you know, do you see any difference in the, in the ability to get people to dance? I think you are way too far in the weeds with this, to be perfectly honest, my, <laughs> my, my good friend. Like this, this, it, it, it comes across a little bit, um, what's the right word to use? Like we're splitting a hair here. It, Stevie Wonder, Earth, Wind & Fire, Tower of Power, Skinner, Stones are all played on all of the classic rock stations, right? If you asked anyone that wasn't a student of music, they would tell you that's rock and roll for any of those bands, right? They're all, there's a 2-4 groove that they wouldn't be able to tell you, necessarily be able to tell you that. But it's like, yeah. you know, this is just rock and roll. It, it yes, there. I, like I agree, with you. you're not wrong that that like we can break it down and be like, well, this is soul, this is leaning towards funk, this is leaning towards this. But but they all, you know, like you said, they they fueled the growth of rock and roll, but they also grew alongside it and with it. So there's so much interaction there that and 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 sort of uh, cross pollination there that I don't know that you really can 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 separate it out and say, yes, this silo, this silo, this silo. To well, say that sort of, except it, it plays itself out in the world, right? So when I look around at what, you know, like all these um, sites where, where cover bands post their 
their set lists. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of classic rock still 20 years down the road. And sure, but September is also on those lists, right? I don't think so, man. Yeah, it is. I mean, I see it like, <laughs> like, I, you know, it's like, they, like if no you're a wedding band, maybe, but I, I'm seeing a lot more purist. My observation is mm. I see a lot more purist classic rock bands. If you ask bands what they are, they say classic rock. Yeah. And I don't think September makes the cut if you're a classic rock band. Yeah, but super, okay, so superstition does. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? Like, there's there's always going to be those little things that, that cross over. I mean, I've played in bands that say they're classic rock bands, and it's like, all right, well, let's, let's, you know, let's play What is Hip. It's like, okay, okay. But, you know, the classic rock station also played What is Hip four hours earlier on the air, you know. So I, I will readily say that to me, rock and roll is a very religious thing. You know, it, sure. it is, you know. The, the cultural change that it represents, the social change, you know, the, the uh, so much about the history of it and so much about the, uh, the meaning of it and the approach to the music. And that, like, and I'll say this, there's rock and roll is kind of every man's music, right? Like you don't have to be a virtuoso singer to find some strand of rock and roll that you have a chance to, you know, communicating with some passion and some, and some truth. Sure. A little bit harder, you know, in some of the, I'll, like, I'll give you an example. Parliament never spoke to me. Okay. People love Parliament. Yeah. A lot of people took people, acid and went to see Parliament too. And that might be part of the reason they love it. So that's, know. that's possible. That's possible. I just, you know, those kind of like those, those lines and those, you know, I, there's not as much in modern, or I'd say starting late seventies funk, that really spoke to me that much. It's kind yeah. of like an impact. It didn't talk to me about, you know, youth, you know, when you're a kid, you're a teenager laying in your bed trying to figure the world out. There was way more to draw from, from rock and roll that gave you a little sense of the world. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just about like, the party. No, you, you're right. Yeah. The, 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 the earth, wind and fire and the tower power and the, you know, the funkadelic and all that, it, it all is about the party. It, like, and, and of course, you know, there's an asterisk there that it's not all about it, but, but that's, that's sort of the vibe that that communicates is like, it's party. But the Marvin Gaye stuff was about the world, right? right. That, that was totally. the message, right? So, so there, there was a kind of a change there and that's the, well, that's the, where I grew up from and that's the way I viewed it. And it didn't seem like, like you were in one of two camps as a music listener, right? You were, you were a kid of rock and roll or you were not a kid of rock and roll. Right. And, um, that, in, I think many people start with that, you know, it's the music that you listen to growing up. Sure. And when you become a weekend warrior to semi-professional to even professional, I mean, it, 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 you want to, you want to emote the stuff that had some truth to you. You want other people to feel what you felt listening to that stuff. Right. And that's kind of probably why you take the initial direction as an, as a semi-professional, again, as a professional, you're going to play what's put in front of you and you know, wherever, wherever, wherever the check is, is probably where you're going to go. Right. Yes. I, so but, I, I, I want to be careful that we don't assign what our experiences are onto everyone because what you just said is a hundred percent true for you, but is not even close to true for me. Right. So yes, I listened to rock and roll, but when I started to playing in bands, it was very much with, okay, let's go play what people want to hear, right. not the songs I want to play for people. Like there was, but, but I started my, my first experience playing in bands was playing in like school bands, right? Like that's, those were my first experiences on a stage of any kind. And that was, you know, the, the music was chosen by the band directors or whatever. Right. You know, and so, yeah. so like, like what you went through is very much true for you. And I'm sure there are other people for whom that it's also true, but it's not yeah. a universal truth. Like, it, you know, when, when I started playing in bands, the, the first real band that I joined played music that I would have like, and probably did the day before say that I hated, I never would have listened to the cure and REM and, and, you know, the pixies, which I still don't like. Um, that didn't work. You know, the police, yes, I was sort of into the police, you know, actually more than sort of, uh, but you know, they, that that's the kind of stuff that this band was playing, but they were like, you know, we've got gigs. I'm like, let's go play. Like I watched them at a talent show and it was like, Oh, Holy crap. Like people are into this. Okay. I'm in, you know? And I think that's a pretty true story for some segment of, of people too. It's like, I want to go, I mean, you know, for me, it, it truly wasn't about like, I want to go get girls. It was like, I want to play for people, but there's, you know, there's the sort of the tongue in cheek story of like, well, I, I wanted to meet girls. So I went and started playing music, you know, and, um, and there's, there's some truth in that. So, yeah. 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 So my point to all this is, as we look forward to coming out of the clouds here with live music, 
Yeah. Is this, is the slate clean and the ability to interpret any type of music going to present itself in a different way? I mean, a lot of clubs are going under, you know, music genres have evolved. Again, I'm still amazed that we see so much classic rock as, as a large foundation of, of cover band music uh, across the country, across the world. Yeah. Um, that, that those, you know, there's so much overlap in those playlists. There's the, the rock and roll fake book. Right. Right. So the question is, is like coming out of this, do you think, um, do you think live music will present better opportunities for different genres to reestablish themselves, assert themselves? Um, again, my premise, any music can be dance music, dance you know, there's a difference between disco dancing and, you know, just wanting to move. But any music can be music that gets people moving if it's done right. Do you think that when we come out of this again, that live music will all be about getting people's bodies to move or, you know, so much social distancing, it's really going to be acoustic, small trios, singles, duos and trios for a while? Or, you know, will there be a return to dance music and and any style of music can kind of establish itself as something that people are going to want coming out of this. Yeah. I'm mean, being kind of clumsy and asking the question, but no, I get what you're what asking. asking. Yeah. It will, it will, it just go back to being the same as it ever was or yeah. will, you know, and I think it, it's hard to say, right? Because I'm, we all see the world through our own lenses and, and it's, it's difficult. Even when you're trying to look at the big picture, you're still seeing it through your own lenses. So it, it's hard for me to to make any predictions, but what I've been seeing is a declining interest in bands that play the same music as other bands, right? Like, you know, for sure, there's been this, like, it, it, it's a um, sort of a percolation process of the bands that do it really well, okay, there they are, and then the rest of them, it's like, well, do you want, really want to go see that? You have to offer something unique. I think as things come out of this, the bands that are able to innovate their way back to performing live first safely and all of that are going to have a huge leg up with the bands that just say, let's put it on ice until it's back to exactly what we could do before, you know, same size crowd, same size of all that. Like, I think those bands are going to, are going to be hurt by this. Some of them won't be, if you have a loyal following, you have a loyal following and that's that, right. You know, and if you can tap that two years down the road, great. But I think the bands that, you know, people want to to have an escape, especially right now, you, you know, and bands that, that can or acts, I should say, that can deliver that for people will be and are smart about it, like are, you know, making sure they engage with their fan base. They uh, connect with them either on social media or email lists or even better folks, both, you know, but but really getting to know your fan base, getting your fan base to know you. Like bands that are doing that and entertaining now or soon are the ones that are going to make it through this. And I, I honestly, I see a lot of original bands being the ones that are out in front of that right now mm. because those people are the ones that are like, you know, I do this because I wrote these songs and I want to perform them. And, the, you know, you know, when you for the most part, when you're in an original band, like, you know, it's going to be a tough go at it and you just do it anyway. But right. You're actually making my point for me. So, yes, it might be original music. It might be. Yeah. Um, people have been cooped up for so long that they're going to be open to new experiences. Correct. And, and maybe that's the macro point I've been making. Is that's, that that's yes. Live, yeah. Live music scene where I am and I'm assuming it's in many places. Uh, get stuck in a certain dogma, right? It yep. gets stuck in, this is the way we do it. This is the way we've always done it. This is the kind of clubs that we have. This is, you know, we have, we have, uh, you know, classic rock clubs or we have acoustic music venues or we have, you know, original music clubs. Yeah. But that whole slate may get, what you know, got to look at it in a really macro sense that you basically have a bunch of pent up demand of people who not only want to engage, they just want to get out of their house and they're ready for <laughs> some kind of new experience, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna. So it's interesting. I've been looking, you know, like the the small venues and lots of small venues have been going out of business for obvious reasons, you know, financial reasons that they can't, you know, keep people in the doors and so they can't stay afloat. Um, but I feel like those are easier to get back up and running, even if it's, you know, new ownership or whatever, than the huge venues like like Red Rocks just announced that it's, you know, closing Terrible. down indefinitely. And it's like, yeah. 
that that like that's one of my favorite venues. I uh, if you've never seen a show at Red that's Rocks, a bucket list for me. Oh, dude, yeah, yeah. No. It, you know, it's funny. People always ask, it, you know, not always, but but you know, the, the conversation comes up. What's the best place you've ever seen a concert? And it's like, okay, well. I mean, there's Red Rocks, but then really we should be talking about number two, like because there's nothing that competes with that that I've ever found. But um, you know, they they announced that they were closing indefinitely. Now that doesn't mean there will never be another show at Red Rocks again. I guarantee you there will be. Having been there, I can tell you it holds nine thousand people. But if you put three thousand people in there, like the way that that place is built and the 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 angle, the steep angle. Like it would probably be safe today with 3000 people. Now this might not be economically safe with 3000 people, Yeah, you know? And so, but that's going to force these bigger venues. Think about your band. Like if you're a band that, you know, at its best can, can fill a 2000 person theater. Now I, I realize that most bands can't do that, but if you're that band and you're touring around the country, playing all those little theaters, well, you ain't going to be playing those little theaters anytime soon. But what if the Red Rocks and other, ven you know, 10,000 seat venues figured out like, wait a minute, how do we get these 2000 seat bands to play our venues so that it, it we don't like, because if you, if you bring Springsteen or, you know, any, you know, a list act to uh, an arena and say, okay, yep, it holds 12,000 people, but we're only going to let, you know, 2,500 people in tonight. The streets are going to be mobbed, right? You you have created an unsafe environment just by the fact that Springsteen is playing in this in this venue, right? For for a small number of people, but if you bring a band in that really only ever fills two thousand seats, but you can now put them in two thousand seats in a twelve thousand seat venue, okay, like maybe there's a safe way to move forward here, and maybe this is how the the concert touring industry keeps itself moving. I don't want to say afloat or alive or anything like that, but like innovating through this is the key. I don't think we get to say, I want to go back because there's no going back, right? There's only moving forward and there's no bypassing this unless you just wait forever, uh, you know, innovating through it. Like the, I, I feel like there are opportunities here. It's just, we need to reset the, the financial expectations of everybody involved, the catering, that, you know, security, vending, you know, the, the, the venue owners themselves, like, nope, you're not going to put 10,000 people in here. So can you open the doors to 2000 people? What does that math look like? What do you offer differently to make that a reality? You know, those kinds of things. And I think that happens even at a smaller scale with, you know, with, with smaller clubs, if you had a club that could hold 500 people, okay, well now it can hold 150. So now, you know, what bands do you bring in you got to sort of rethink that whole thing. And I, I think there's an opportunity here for the people that are the musicians, the acts that are engaging with their audiences, even when they're not playing, like, you know, staying in touch, you know, tending that audience and growing it through live streams. Or, you know, if you have the opportunity to play, like, you know, like that bitter pill show this weekend that I'm still bummed about missing. Uh, it, you know, where there were people in the lawn and they like, they set up circles of socially distancing and all of that stuff. I mean, it was great. The pictures I saw from it and, and my bandmates mm -hmm. told me it was great, you know, like those kinds of things, but that they gave people something to do that. That's, that's the key right there is people got to leave their house. They got to feel safe. And now they take that memory with them and it's like, Oh wait, bitter pills playing again. Oh, they did a good thing the last time. What's the next one look like? And, you know, just being able to kind of do some of that in, and every area is different. You know, we're, like I said, we're fortunate here that we're not in a terrible scenario. So we're able to do some of these things. And so taking advantage of that when it's safe, as opposed to waiting until it's over, uh, I think is the smart move, but, but it, you know, you got to balance your, uh, your desire to play your impatience with what's safe kind of like I have to with, you know, my surgery, <laughs> <laughs> take some of your own advice, Dave. So yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, we uh, shall see and we'll keep our eyes on it and we'll, you know, we'll see. Hopefully yeah. this is maybe an opportunity for a renaissance for, for original music, good original music to find its way onto stages sooner. Yeah. And maybe you'll grab those music fans sooner this time. I don't know. Yeah, but that's right. I, just, I think we were I, moving yeah. in that direction anyway. I think I think this has accelerated it. Hopefully, potentially. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. 
What do you think, folks? Let us know. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. It's, it's, what, it's why we do what we do. Well, we do this because we love it. But we also love to hear from you. What else you got to say, man? Always be performing. No matter what. 